Hi, everybody. This is Matthias Friedrich from Montreal today, and uh, I welcome you to today's CMR Journal Club. And uh, I want to send a special welcome to, uh, to the authors, uh, see Vivek Muthurangu, um, just joined, and I, and I also see Timo Haidt there. Um, they are the corresponding authors of two interesting papers we'll discuss today. The topic is um, interventional CMR. Now, interventional CMR has been around for a while, and it was up initially to a slow start. Um, there were lots of, let's say, roadblocks, but over the recent years, there was mostly the material that was used because interventions require catheters and guide wires and, and stuff like that that need to be um, controlled uh, and uh, so need to be steerable. So that means the, the, the torque and the materials play an important role. And it was difficult to construct uh, or produce material that would be suitable. And uh, there has been some progress, and it's uh, while maybe it's not uh, yet uh, prime time, um, these two papers actually shed light on the current status. One is more experimental and one is more uh, clinical. Uh, so before we start, as usual, um, please mute yourself if, uh, if you're not speaking. Um, and uh, also, uh, if you have a question and you do not want to interrupt or so, you, you're always welcome to put them into the chat and, uh, and I can ask them then there, thereafter in the short discussion. As usual, we go through the papers in about 10 minutes, leaving some time for discussion. Um, and so let's get started with the first one that, uh, that was published uh, a few weeks ago in Scientific Reports. And it's on real-time magnetic resonance imaging guided coronary intervention in a porcine model. So I will stop sharing and will hand over to Timo Haidt. Uh, he's uh, the first author from the Universitätszentrum Freiburg, um, uh, University Hospital in the southwest of uh, Germany. Timo, hello, and thank you very much for joining. So hello. Good morning, or good afternoon, whatever applies to you. So uh, thanks for the introduction, and um, I see it. I can share my slides here. Yeah. Okay, so just to start with, um, I'm a clinical cardiologist working in the field of interventional, um, interventional cath catheterization. And so I was ve I'm very pleased to be, have the chance to discuss um, the results from uh, our paper here with you. Um, so to start, to, first I would like to give you some background, what actually triggered us to, to approach uh, the coronaries for intervention in, in this model. And so thinking about it, I st still personally believe that for now and also uh, for the near future, actual fluoroscopy based strategies are still the gold standard for uh, coronary interventions. Just uh, that, gi given that, because that offers you actually a high temporal and spatial resolution and it gives you immediate access to the patient, which is very important in this setting. And however, there are limitations to that technique. So um, you have everything you see is two dimensional. It's a projection. So you have to move your C arm around to really get a different angle of your coronaries. And you have to use contrastation. And we are all aware of the difficulties that uh, iodinated contrastation may trigger with imp impaired kidney function or um, hyperactivity of the thyroid gland. So there is irradiation to the procedure, which is maybe less important for the patient because he maybe undergoes that in intervention once in a while, but it may be important in, uh, in younger patients and young adults or children, and it may be important for the interventional staff. And so they're, they're exposed to that every day. One more point that I think is a limitation is that in recent years, um, the, the significance of actually the coronary vessel wall has increased importance. And um, so, but um, coronary catheterization and contrast-based um, techniques so far only give you an indirect um, approach to your vessel wall. So you fill the vessel with contrast agent, that's, this is basically what you see. Um, so looking into the future, I think it's, uh, there are reasonable questions if that's really a technique to rely on um, uh, as a long-term goal, or if there are alternative techniques. And there is, of course, magnetic resonance imaging coming into play as an, a radiation-free alternative, providing you with an excellent soft tissue contrast and giving you actually the opportunity to see everything in arbitrary slice orientation. You can everything see everything as you need it. 
it, it gives you the direct visualization of the vessel wall that is maybe for now still the discussions about um, the um, temporal and spatial resolution, but um, you actually see the vessel wall. And this maybe in the future give you a further alternative techniques as molecular based contrast agent that lets you see um, vascular inflammation, but that's a different topic not, uh, that I want to, don't want to go into today. And you have the chance to see everything without a contrast agent. So there is, um, as Matthias Friedrich said, there is substantial progress being made, made in the field of interventional um, magnetic resonance imaging. And we will see, hear the, see the paper of Vivek Muturangwa later on um, the right heart catheterization. That's one um, area where this technique already passed the hurdle for its clinical um, application. And there's others in electrophysiology, EP ablations, and um, there is endomyocardial biopsies on its way. And so this raised uh, the question if maybe, maybe the coronaries can really be addressed. And we're not certainly not the first one to do that. We heard that uh, th this has been tackled before. There's, th there's papers from 2002 and 2003 that went uh, to also to see um, if coronary interventions can be performed. And um, in 2002, this was the group of Spoontrop and his colleagues, and they, but they used an unfavorable carotid axis because there are limitations to the technique in terms of techni technical aspects, and the carotid gives you a straight access to the coronaries, and they could show that uh, previously. And in 2003, there was a dark model being used by Sir Fadi and his, his colleagues, but they did not do any intervention, but just a catheterization. So after 16 years, we now think about, is it really um, the time that we can do, um, investigate, like do, uh, perform a fully MR-guided coronary intervention? And to start with actually going through the, our paper, I would like to start actually with, with our last figure, because that's basically the setup of our, of our um, in-room in -room setup. So we, we used a three Tesla uh, Prisma from Siemens, Siemens, and we had a shielded in-room monitor. So we decided to use three Tesla because um, we think that this may um, give you some more um, spatial resolution um, for imaging, while still for technical aspects, the three Tesla may, be, may also have, provide some disadvantages. We used a shielded in-room monitor, and this is our setup for communication. We did not use any fancy. We just used the normal patient in-room um, communication to talk to our um, assistant sitting um, in front of the door at, at the computer. And we saw basically we had a screen share so we can, could really communicate um, what we would like to see on, on our interventional screen here. And on the right, you see roadmaps. So these were acquired using um, ECG and respiratory gated 3D whole heart sequence that we uh, performed up front so that we could reconstruct the coronary vessels and also do use these roadmaps imaging, images for planning our procedure. So during imaging, we could, by just um, communicate, communicating to, um, to, to, to our colleagues, um, change the image planes, planes, planes as needed. So after putting an, well, so we next we put an arterial axis line in, into the, into the right groin, and advanced uh, standard clinical five French catheters. These are normally being used for diagnostics. And here you can see basically an image of this in vivo, within the pig, and this is outside, and you already see what the problem that has been addressed, that you have major artifacts by the by normal clinic, um, standard clinical catheters, because they're optimized for, um, uh, for x-ray technology. So in order to uh, proceed, you have to have ex excellent handling, and therefore the magnetic or metallic braiding is incorporated into the shaft that gives you the support that is needed to steer the catheter within the vasculature. Yeah. Furthermore, the, the, the tip of the catheter is not as in, for, in its impaired invisibility. And without the first animal, it took us over, and we could not achieve any situation of the left coronary um, osteo. So we basically um, went further to see if there is catheters that have, uh, have better braiding. And we came up, there are actually five French diagnostic cath catheters that have sufficient braiding that they keep the, uh, the steerability and have less artifacts. But we always encountered the difficulty that 
in MRI, you have just one image slice. So you're not having okay. protection. So your catheter may enter and leave your image slice without you okay. noticing it. And so you develop an active tip mark. It's basically an active tip call that's hooked up to the um, system using an actual cable that runs inside the catheter. Um, and it leaves, gives you a bright tip. And this really improved uh, the intubation of the coronary ostium. And we applied that tip here to a five French diagnostic catheter and later on also to a custom made um, eight French catheter um, in order this, this was being used for intervention later on. But I will get to that later again. So here you see basically this was then um, the images that we received using our five French diagnostic catheter with active disc marking. And you can see that while using our roadmap as the catheter is advanced, you can clearly see what exactly where you are. And you can really visualize how you intubate the left coronary ostium with your catheter using the five French. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you please mute yourself? I think it's Alex's iPhone that is creating uh, a lot of noise. Uh, please mute yourself. If you're, when you're not speaking. Um, okay, hopefully that's... Can you please mute yourself? Uh, um, Liz, can you can you um, can you mute uh, the, uh, the attendees? Yeah, very sorry here. Okay, okay. I think we should just continue, and let's hope they will they will get it at some point. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, no problem. So when we're using that active tip marker, we were actually able basically to, to intubate the left coronary ostium. That we, so we did that. Um, we tried that repeatedly, and we really improved times that after entering into the vessel in the groin, um, intubation of the left coronary ostium was possible even within, within what, in less than five minutes. In, in the mean, we took us one to two minutes to intubate. That was pr obviously more problematic using the um, for the interventional catheter, which was eight French, because we we had we we found that all six French these are the interventional catheters that are normally being used are had, do have ferromagnetic properties and cannot be used in the in MRI, and so we 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 were forced to custom design um, a catheter and we replaced the metal braiding for for durability by Kevlar. So that, that we had a Kepler shaft that um, also had a double lumen and gave us the chance to, to put an interventional um, balloon and send through the catheter. And the other lumen was used for the coaxial cable that we, we needed to have this active tip marking. And of course, this um, just a pure size because we used a uh, mini pig model. So animals were about 50 kilograms, but still the, the size of eight French was, it was very large. So. The, this really impaired handling. So the success rate was, uh, was clearly lower and we were, we were able to intubate the left coronary arteries in, in half of the cases with this interventional catheter. So there is still, of course, um, room for a lot of improvement to that. But once having the, the catheter in place, you can um, do, uh, do different things. You can inject just diluted contrast, gadolinium contrast agent, and showed selective coronary perfusion as this was done here. So these are short axis slices of the, of the left ventricle. And we injected gadolinium contrast agent in a diluted, diluted form. So one, so one to 20 dilution we used into the left coronary atrium and you, and you could track the, the perfused area. And of course you can do um, investigations as um, registering the, 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 the upslope of your contrast floating into the left vessel as this is um, done for also for stress perfusion imaging. And then we, in cooperation with Marvitz International, we used um, MR safe guide wire. So this is a guide wire that's constructed of fiberglass and aramide fibers 
and have microparticles of iron oxide in their shaft. So they do uh, use, um, they give you a strong um, signal decay in the MR image, and but are clear can clearly be seen on on the MR screen. So you can um, re realize how you basically introduce the the um, guide wire into the left coronary. And this is shown here. Of course, the, the signal that you receive, while it is, gives you a very good, um, as you can realize how you advance your catheter, you unfortunately get blind for the vessel that you're actually actually targeting. And so there, there is still room also here for optimization of the strength of that, of that iron oxide signal. Um, but uh, so we're still in, con in contact to the company to in hope that we can get this to a, a degree where we, where we can clearly still see the vessel that we're treating. Over that wire, we then in, in advanced um, um, metal-free bioresorbable scaffold system. That's the basic, that's the ad, absorbs um, scaffold that is produced by the, by the Abbott company. And even though it's not in clinical application anymore due to complications to, of the scaffold system, it gives you the very nice, it's completely metal-free and purely invisible in the, in the MR image. So you have very low artifacts and an Abbott company provided us with also with the metal-free um, delivery system so we could deploy the scaffold in the coronary. And over the guide, over the guide wire, we advanced um, the balloon just into the proximal parts because the more distal you get, the, also the visibility decreases. Um, but you could actually track the, the inflation and deflation of the, of the stent balloon um, by real-time acquisition. Afterwards, um, you see the properties that are the, the scaffold so that you can clearly see that the, ve the vessel is still completely patent and visible on the MR, MR scan, so there is no, no artifacts. So the, the acquisition was later on tracked by pathology investments um, that, that are shown in these images here. So overall, um, to summarize this, um, we, we, we managed to do a, a fully MR-guided coronary intervention. There's, of course, still a lot of room for improvement. This is nothing that translates into clinical application in the near future, but uh, is certainly um, uh, an intriguing path to follow along because it may um, give especially some patient cohorts that may be especially susceptible, patients with impaired kidney functions, patients with, uh, that are susceptible for radiation, um, a, new, uh, a treatment option that could help them in future. And therefore, I thank you. Thank you very much, um, and sorry for the audio chaos in the beginning. So, um, uh, while um, Vivek is setting up, and could you please then unshare yourself so that Vivek can share his screen. Um, so, the bottom line then seems to be that there is more work to do, um, and uh, we're, we're on, I think, on the way to uh, allowing CMR to also be the environment for interventions uh, at the coronary arteries, but it's probably a way to go. One, um, as far as I understood, uh, you is, is really the, the catheter itself because the Kevlar um, coating made it too thick to, to be uh, easily steerable. So um, I would, well, there are two questions actually, but I would like in the interest of time, would ask Vivek to first go through his paper and then we'll discuss both uh, together. So Vivek, thank you very much for joining and... Uh, thank you, Matthias. So I'm here with uh, uh, Dan Knight, who... Uh, is Hi, Dan Knight. Uh, first uh, offer, yeah. So we're going to, we're going to uh, share this. So. Um, yeah. uh, as Timo said, actually, you know, and you said, Matthias, the first uh, MR cath, I mean, I was involved in the first human one uh, in, for the right heart cath in 2002. And, and 17 years later, not much has really evolved. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a shame. And yeah. I think one of the reasons is that we made it a little bit too complicated very early on. We said that you needed a hybrid cath MR suite. We said that you needed to have fiber optic uh, um, headphones and audio equipment. We said that you needed all sorts of equipment, which made it very expensive, which was a real barrier to uptake. And, and we thought that was a problem. Uh, uh, I've been still doing MR cath for the last 17 years, but even I stopped doing MR guided and did what I would call MR augmented. So we put the catheters in uh, in children in the x-ray lab and then we moved them over to MR to do uh, our measurements. So mm -hmm. myself 
and Dan, uh, when uh, Dan started working at the Royal Free Hospital, which is one of our national independent hospitals for adults, we, we thought maybe we need to have a different way of doing this. So our idea was what we call a cath augmented CMR. So it's just a simple CMR where we happen to have a pressure catheter inside you. So we wanted to turn yeah. it around yeah. a bit. And so the whole point of this paper is, can we do right heart cath in a completely normal scanner using very off the shelf equipment, off the shelf sequences? So mm. really we can do it, absolutely everyone can do it. Yeah. So I can hand over to Dan and then I'll maybe close out at the yeah. end. Yeah, so far your screen is still blank, but I think you, you oh, have not, oh, not oh. shared it yet. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, it says it's shared. So, um, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'm going to just try and share content again. Can you see it, Matthias? Uh, it's, uh, it's still blank. Um, I don't feel, I don't feel. Good. Uh, just... No, uh, it's, it's uh, have you shared the right screen uh, because you can actually select what you, exactly what you want to share? I think so because I, I'm doing it on my iPad actually and I'm sharing specific content. Okay, so then let me share it um, okay. just, in, yeah. just in case. Um, yeah. uh, can you unshare? So I stop share? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so and let me uh, just get to mine here. Um, Okay, here we go. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, yeah, super. That's perfect. Okay. Okay. Done. So, yeah. and, and and you just tell me when to advance. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so, to give a bit of background, I work here at the Royal Free, um, which is one of six English adult pulmonary hypertension centres in the UK, and we do about five hundred and sixty right heart catheters a year. Um, and as Vivek was saying, there's obvious benefits in combining MR and right heart cath, and we opened our scanner at the start of 2016. So this has been a sort of development that's been really going on for a couple of years now. Um, in terms of our, um, our setup, the whole aim is to do it in an entirely conventional uh, sort of setup in you know, hardware and software. So if you wouldn't mind scrolling down to figure one, um, that's basically our scanner room. Um, it's a standard 1.5 Tesla uh, Cardiac MR. It has a detachable table. Um, that's the option we took because we knew we wanted to do uh, MR guided cath. In terms of the equipment, as I say, the scanner is entirely standard. The, uh, the drapes on it, as you can see, are just that's a femoral angioplasty drape. Um, the, there's an MR compatible drip stand. Uh, D is the MR compatible blood pressure monitor, which is obviously invasive as well as non invasive. And it, again, it's just a standard kit in a scanner. The only maybe slightly non standard kit is C, which is the in room monitor. but in MR terms, they're actually fairly affordable. There's a few of them out there. And it came with our scanner because we knew we wanted to do this procedure. Um, in terms of the imaging we do, um, we just use the standard real-time interactive sequence that came with our scanner. And in terms of catheters, we just use a non-braided uh, non braided six French catheter. Uh, it's an arrow catheter, the one we use, but there are other non-braided catheters that can be used. It's just a balloon wedge end hole catheter, as you'd use in a cath lab, just non-braided. Um, we did have access to a couple of CE marked guide wires that are MR conditional. Uh, one is from Nano from the group and the other is from EP Flex. Um, and they were selected, you know, when I say at random, it slightly depends upon availability on the day of which one. So it wasn't sort of, we weren't comparing the such, so they were on the shelf if we needed. Um, just before I go on to the imaging itself, in terms of patient prep, we actually start with the patient on the table to make sure that we get, thank you, cheers, we, we get them on the table to make sure we actually get the electrode with a decent signal and pop the coil on because when we then detach the table and move them out of the scanner, just outside the scanner door, we have a little prep area. Um, we, we want to make sure that actually, once we've actually done all the sterile drapes, that we have a good ECG signal at the start. We don't want to have to undo all that. So we start off on the scanner table, uh, put the ECG electrodes on, pop the coils on, bring them out, detach the table, bring them outside, then pop the sheep into the femoral vein. Um, that's just our preferred 
mode of access here that's just our standard in the cath lab we use the brachial but obviously that's halfway up the scanner bore so we can't do that practically in the magnet um, we had we have done a case uh, from the internal jugular vein in a lady who had an inferior vena cava filter so it's just our preference our way of doing it um, once the sheath is in the groin and being outside the scanner has benefits it means you don't then take metal into the scanner afterwards uh, so only the catheter operator moves stuff from his prep trolley into the scanner um, and it also means you have uh, monitoring and uh, blood pressure monitor and things outside in case let's say the patient has a vagal event it's probably better outside the scanner than in the scanner um, we then pop the sterile drape onto the patient um, and we sort of wrap them up so that it's the operator side first there is a video online it's the operator side first folded onto the patient and then from the other side over the patient and we bring them back into the scanner um, Oh, so here, here you can see it here. So I guess uh, if you just fast forward that uh, very first little bit, that's us just getting the patient ready on the table as described. Um, and then you'll see we just get head outside to pop the sheath in. Um, so it's, as I say, just a completely conventional environment. That is just an MR compatible patient trolley there, which we use as our workbench for the catheter case. Um, so as you can see there, yep, we bring them outside the scanner. So it means you can have an ultrasound if you need it. You've got the, you know, the rest trolley if you did need it for whatever reason although uh, you know that shouldn't be an issue um, and it's just a more controlled environment out of the scanner no metal goes in the scanner this bit is actually quite important um, it seems trivial but it isn't so the pay, the operator side is wrapped first and then the other side is brought over and that means make sure you have a sterile field and then we transfer the patient back to the scanner whilst Jerry Coughlin who's the catheter operator there whilst he's been putting the sheath in we've draped the scanner with two drapes just a standard femoral angioplasty drape and also a smaller drape going inside the bore so that because we're working from that side we don't de-sterilize while doing it and so that's the setup um, and then uh, thank you for that and if we could go back to figure two if that's okay um, yeah, so we just use the interactive real-time imaging uh, to get going and take three localizer images. So just a bicable view. Uh, so this is in figure uh, figure two. We just do a bicable view, um, RV long axis view, and a PA bifurcation view. And just with those three views, we're good to go that we can actually do the interactive real-time imaging. And then you can see in this uh, in the image below, um, you can see the catheter appears as a signal void, which then I follow through. Uh, so whilst the catheter is being advanced, as you can see in the top left from the right atrium into the right ventricle in B, up towards the RVOT in C, into the main primary artery in D, and towards uh, into the uh, RPA, right primary artery in E, and they're finally wedged. Um, and that's, that's essentially the procedure. And I uh, follow uh, the catheter up and copy those localized, uh, those localized images and obviously move it in real time to actually follow the catheter up. It's just passive passive uh, movement, passive tracking. So in terms of uh, a bit of background, so the patients, we, we started November 2017 and in 11 months we've done 50 cases and they were, they were a total range of patients either undiagnosed or, uh, or known pulmonary hypertension. Um, in terms of uh, the patients uh, who, they, they, they about 64% were in group uh, functional class three. Um, so they were, uh, certainly a sort of standard clinic cohort of pulmonary hypertension patients and you can see there's a real range of uh, pulmonary hemodynamics and right heart size there. So in terms of the results, the key thing is in terms of actually how we did, in terms of how feasible is it. So you can see there's a graph uh, further down, further down. Yeah, there, yeah. that graph. So this is the key, the key figure really. So these are our um, our procedure times for the 50 cases including our learning curve and if I explain it from the bottom up so the catheter time is the green line that's the time it takes to go from the groin to a stable wedge position and the median time that took was three and a half minutes the time in the blue line is the amount of time it took to do the catheter time but also all of your flows and so in that way you've got all of your data that you'd have from the cath lab so all of your uh, cardiac flows pulmonary vascular resistance and the median time is 15 minutes then to do the whole MR study, which in most people is non-contrast, we got all the functional data, so biventricular volumes and function. The median time on the red line is half an hour. There were some patients who did have contrast studies though. And then there's the department time at the top, which is essentially the time from the front door to leaving the department. So actually entering to leaving, so all of the sheath insertion, getting them on the table, getting them out the scanner, the median was one hour. And you can see it actually got quicker 
you know, as people got more familiar with the environment. But I think a median time of one hour is totally acceptable for, you know, clinical reality of doing MR guided right heart cath. Um, just a final point in terms of actually predictors of procedural failure or needing a guide wire. We use that as a sort of a composite endpoint um, because we felt, well, first of all, actually, sorry, predictors of time, apologies. Um, there was a table down there uh, you just saw uh, just further yeah. down. A bit further, that one there. So essentially, we, we looked at predictors of procedural, procedural duration. Uh, and as you can see, unsurprisingly, the more dilated the right heart and the more dysfunctional and the more severe the pulmonary hypertension, the longer it took to actually get to a stable wedge position, um, which is fairly unsurprising, but actually useful data to know because out of 50 patients, we failed in three. And in those three, they were all functional class four, all with extremely large right hearts and also uh, very severe pulmonary hypertension. They were all from the groin, so we didn't, uh, we, we didn't actually try them from the neck, but um, that's something to consider for the future. And in terms of the other table that you just showed very quickly, that was the um, predictors of needing a guide wire for procedural failure. So we used that as a composite endpoint because we used a guide wire six times and some of, in, some of, uh, in some of the failure cases, we used a guide wire. Um, and again, unsurprisingly, again, it was the severe, severely dilated right heart, poorly functioning right heart or significant pulmonary hypertension. They were the predictors of uh, guide wire use or procedural failure. But I think overall, those procedure times and actually that feasibility um, demonstrates that I think this is a clinical reality to do. And we're actually doing, I'm about to do our last case this afternoon. So, so I think uh, just to finish off and conclude, I think what we've shown is that you can do it in a normal clinical MR scanner that you don't need a lot of fancy equipment. As I said, we've done about 100 cases now. Uh, and it, yeah, we're, we're looking at about a 5% failure rate. And it's usually in the very, very sick patients. Um, but it's a completely safe procedure. And we do think the added benefit of it's quick. You don't need to have a cath and an MR. So I think there's some cost benefits already uh, for this technique. I think there's some accuracy benefits. And I, we, we feel that this is how people should be doing right heart cath mm. right now. Thank you very much. Um, we're a little bit over time, but uh, I apologize because that had technical reasons. Okay. So, um, so if I may summarize, where we are right now is that there are some applications, like you've beautifully shown here in patients with pulmonary hypertension. And uh, looking back at my uh, the interventional part of my career, I know how difficult it can be in in conventional catheterization in patients with the hugely dilated RVs and such. Uh, so I think that's a fantastic result and that is as you said to be uh, is a clinical reality whereas in terms of interventions and coronary there's still quite a lot of ways to go and um, my question to to basically whoever wants to jump in first would be partially related to a question from Andrew Korstein from Montreal who says okay this is the chicken egg problem because people think it's not it's not uh, that easy they will not start doing it but once we but because people are not started doing it, there is no urge from the industry to develop uh, and, and deliver the, the, the material. So how can, we, uh, how can we get further to that, uh, aside from providing the evidence, as, as you did, Dan and, and, and Vivek, uh, to, to show that it's working? What can we do next, and where are the, the most important hurdles to get us further? Where are the roadblocks? Is it still the material, or is it now a matter of the acceptance in the field? So if I, if I can jump in, I think uh, at our center, because we're doing this now quite often, we do it you know, every week, we actually have other centers come over. So we've had VUMC, we've had Karolinska come over, and they're already doing MR cath. So one of the things is I think it's important when people are starting to do it that you can invite guests over so that they can go back and take the technology back. I think mm -hmm. you have to use very simple equipment. Now, the group from VUMC are not that interested in right heart cath, they were interested in EP, but they wanted to see something work in patients before they spent all of that money on an interventional lab or an EP lab. Yeah. So I think in some ways, right heart cath is your sort of gateway into yeah. interventional MR. It already has benefit, but I think it can show the way to for new technologies. And as you say, unless we have uh, probably a hundred units in the world doing right heart cath this way, the vendors are never going to profitably be able to make better guide wires, yeah. etc. So we need lots yeah. and lots of units to do. So yeah. I would 
open an invite to yeah. anyone on the call. If they want to come and see MR Cat, they're very welcome to come and see it at uh, Royal Free. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I may take you, you on that one. <laughs> no, I honestly, I totally agree with you. We have to, at least for these indications, we have to just get started and show, cause, uh, because uh, otherwise if people don't see it, uh, I myself have to say, I think there's a lot of potential also in the P. As you said, uh, they are very interested in getting into it and having witnessed this uh, procedure myself in Leipzig, mm -hmm. I was absolutely deeply impressed by, by what I saw. So those centers can show, yeah, hey, this is reality, this actually works. So then uh, looking a bit forward, so that to, to uh, you team, one question I had to you is, uh, 3T environment, why you, as you said, it may provide more spatial resolution, it, of course you deal with way more artifacts. So that didn't uh, deter you from, from doing that, or have you ever done some work on 1.5 and compared that? Um, so actually, we, we, we started um, using 3T because um, one of our projects, and which is not mentioned in this uh, in this paper, is also that it going into molecular contrast agents. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we think that the 3T environment will give us some uh, benefits there. And this basically was just, but I, uh, this was what triggered us um, going into the 3T direction. And mm -hmm. because okay. our um, basically goal in the future would be you, you actually track and inflame coronary endothelium in the MRC and yeah. basically um, find the vulnerable plaque and seal it by, use, by, in, by MR guided intervention. And so okay. this is really where this, this is our road ahead, uh, I would say. Yeah. But okay. this, of course, it's a far future perspective. But this actually made us go into the Thank you so much that we had the opportunity to speak with two of the pioneers in, in that field. Uh, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good summary where we are right now. So there are already some real life clinical applications. Next, maybe the next uh, door to open is to EP uh, because there's a whole world there that needs that. And then looking forward to future development in the coronary. So thank you both so much. Before we finish off, I just want to briefly mention that for next week, we'll have two papers as well, so in two weeks, we'll to discuss the two landmark papers that have been published on coronary perfusion. One is the MR informed trial, and the other one is uh, the SPINS trial that was also published just, uh, I think, uh, 10 days ago. Uh, both landmark trials on uh, first pass coronary, uh, uh, first pass um, MR perfusion, and I'm looking forward to discussing that with the authors there. For today, I want to thank everybody uh, on the call for joining, and especially you, Timo and Vivek, for joining and for this wonderful discussion. Thanks thank a you. lot, and talk sometime soon. Yeah, bye bye. Bye bye. -bye.